if uh, you have looked at the syllabus, for those of you who had the interest and the time, there is a section in the syllabus uh, called on the dangerousness of reflection. Okay. So let me uh, talk about that for a minute because it is important for those of you who may take these ideas seriously or you may find these ideas somewhat entertaining and you may have this unpleasant or you may be foolish enough to take these ideas some and talk about them with your companion or friends or parents. Don't do it. Remember you came to this class for one reason, three units, a grade, to get a step closer to finishing Laney and going to San Francisco or Yale or Oxford. Your job here is not to really reflect about anything. Seriously. Now, I know you shake your head, you think uh, that I'm just joking, I'm not. Now, let me give you a couple of stories about reflection and how it's different from thinking. And I'm going to borrow from my good friend, Leo Tolstoy. There are lots of people out there who've gone through uh, these stages, but right now Tolstoy comes to mind. So, and again, forgive me those of you who've been in my classes and since I no longer read or watch or listen to anything, most of my stories are the same. I don't have any new thing to offer you. So, uh, and Tolstoy, um, he had, he was cursed really. He was cursed to feel and then to reflect. And then he had this ability to write and be a creative. These are like diseases that will destroy you. At the age of 15, one morning, Leo Tolstoy had a lot of power, i.e. money, servants, big house. While he just uh, ordering himself 50 Subway sandwiches to go home and eat and watch the show Succession, at the age of 15, all of a sudden, this question comes upon him. And it's not just a question that would come and go. It is a question that he felt deeply. It was like an earthquake. Who am I? What's the meaning of my life? What's it all about? All of us in this class ask. We all ask it. It's just that you and I are very, very, very lucky because our life is very distracting. These questions are not going to last very long inside you. They get demolished very quickly. Now, and you don't really need to do any effort to have these questions go away. Life will do that for us. You know, you may have a very, very earnest presence in this room asking questions that you actually feel and care about. But just wait until 10.45 where you have to carry your sorry behind to a math class. And the moment you walk into a math class, all the questions you cared for in your ethics class, they all disappear. That's what life does. And that's what Tolstoy did to some extent. The moment he realized that he's feeling these questions too much, it's impacting his relationship to money. It's impacting his relationship to his friends, his parents, his position in life. He didn't know what to do with this poverty that was brought about by the question. So he was very creative to push it under the rug. At the age of 20, the same question or set of questions would come up. Who am I? What am I? What's the meaning of my life? Is there a goal? What should I do with the short few hours of my existence? But unlike us, the question wasn't intellectual. He didn't like read a book and then ask a question. His relationship to these questions were profoundly, profoundly intimate, i.e. emotional. And he would feel himself being pushed around by the force of these questions. Again, again, he was very creative and talented to push the questions away so he could continue with life. For those of you in this class who have had parents that you didn't really enjoy, 
but you were forced to just see them on a daily basis, what would happen to you? You would repress certain emotions. You would put your physical body in a certain space where you didn't have to see your father, think about your father. And if you don't see your father, if you don't think about your father, well, you don't have certain emotions. You can just live your life casually, comfortably. When Tolstoy got to be around the mid-30s, these questions were profoundly forceful. They wouldn't leave him alone. He would wake up. What am I doing? He would be eating. What am I doing? He'd be with his wife. Why? He would see his kids. Why? And it came to a point where the questions would not leave him alone. It's like cancer. Are you, you're not only physically in the presence of these questions, you're also intellectually and emotionally. Now, the problem is the following. It's something we talked about on Monday. Whenever you have a problem in your life, you use your thick skull to find a remedy, to find a solution. Tolstoy also came to realize there are no answers to these questions. Why is it that money all of a sudden raises his social status? What makes him different from a janitor? And he comes to reflect and he comes to realize nothing. What is the difference between the living and the dead? Nothing. The living just basically waste their time until they reach their death. In the end, they'll both be forgotten. Neither have done anything valuable. Tolstoy becomes depressed. Upon depression, he begins to reflect. Now, thinking, I say something to you in this class, and it goes against your belief system. Let me give you an example. Did you know, and this is mostly for my Muslim friends, okay? There are, if I'm not mistaken, 114 chapters in the Quran, right? Did you know that in a museum in France, there is actually a Quran with 116 verses, I mean chapters? To some of my Christian friends, did you know that there are approximately 40 Gospels? 40 of them. Not just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Judas, Nicodemus, infancy, Mary. Now, imagine you are a devout Muslim or a devout Christian, and upon hearing what I say, you have a reaction. No, I've always believed in the Quran. I've always believed in the Prophet Muhammad. There is only 114. You react. You're not going to take your behind to the library. You're not going to do research. You react. It's called thinking. And you do it with good intentions. You want to go home and pray. You want your belief system to remain intact. You don't want to suffer unnecessary pain. You want to continue to believe in God. You want to believe that Jesus, in fact, did exist. If I was to tell you that, in fact, the virgin birth does not exist, not even in the Gospel of Luke, because in its original translation, it's not a virgin, it's simply a young woman. But if you were to think about it and then reflect on it, your belief system may collapse. Your rights and wrongs, do's and don'ts may collapse. So remember, thinking is always reacting to an external force. Always. Reflecting, on the other hand, you have an information coming to you, either from your own experiences, you witness it, or someone from the outside. You want to react, but you say, no, 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 wait a minute. Let me think about what this person is saying. Why am I reacting in such a way? I mean, I don't own Islam or Jesus. 
I've inherited this stuff. My father slaved away. He saved a million bucks. I've been watching TV most of my life. My father is dead. I got the money. I don't have any work ethics. I don't know the value of money. I don't know the value of hard work. I've just been playing video games and all of a sudden all this money is on my lap. Reflection means you detach yourself. You walk away from feelings. You walk away from history. You walk away from reacting. And you sit somewhere, man, and it's a lonely place to be. Because when you reflect, you have to do the work. You have to find the answers. You have to be the light to the problem and the solution. By the time you get to a place of reflection, you have suffered great many doubts, great many disappointments. This is not to disturb my Muslim friends. Where Muhammad lived, okay, it was like Costco. You have Buddhism, you have Hinduism, you have Judaism, you have Christianity. You have the Bedouin culture, tribal culture. The belief systems are there. And the belief system protect you. You stop when the light is red. You go when the light is green. Pay attention when it's orange. I mean, that's what culture gives you. How to live your life. But not for the Buddha. Not for Muhammad. Not for Moses. Not for Jesus. They have this passion. They want to know themselves. They don't want to be told. They want to figure things out on their own. And that is the business of reflection. You think. You feel. You're lost. You have doubts. And you're in the dark. And you live in the dark for a long, long, long time. Now, the problem facing those of you who enjoy reflection, who enjoy feeling, you don't live in a reflective philosophical culture. If you've had a father or a mother or both parents who have worked tirelessly to just food, put food on the table, should you have a religious or an existential crisis you may go to your dad and say, Dad, I am lost, I am so sad, I have no idea what to do. But your father has a culture inside him. That culture is, I go and till the ground at six in the morning, I come home back, I come home at six at night, I shower and I'm exhausted. I don't wanna read, I don't wanna talk, I wanna be left alone, I wanna just eat my food, watch some TV, enjoy my family, not by conversation, and if conversation, nothing heavy. So when you go to that particular father with that particular culture and history inside him, he's not going to help you. If on the other hand, your father is a Muhammad or a Jesus Christ, and all of a sudden you suffer a crisis, and you go to that particular person and say, Dad, I just feel alienated, lost and confused. What do I need to do? Your father's culture is what? Son, let me tell you. All of a sudden, at the age of 12, I looked at my parents and I realized I have zero feelings about them. I looked at the Talmud and I realized at the Old Testament and I realized I don't care about the books. None of the 38 books, I don't care about them. I went to the synagogue and I realized it's just bricks. Don't care about that either. And I realize all of a sudden, I have these questions, these yearnings and longings. I want to figure things out on my own. I got lost. I was confused. I was in the dark. Not just for a month or two, for 18 long years. So let me tell you what it means to be lost, to have no parents, to be lonely, to be depressed, to go on this journey, whether it's intellectual, emotional, spiritual, doesn't really matter. Now, what you have is a culture, a father, who knows the steps. The younger the culture, the more unreflective the culture. If you're a human being, you have no choice but to suffer. 
what human beings have been going through for thousands of years. Which means that every single one of you in this class, should you encounter an intellectual or even a physical crisis, you have no roadmaps. The culture doesn't give you one. If that's a little difficult to imagine, let me give it to you in this way, and then we'll go home. What time is this class over? So we have 15? 15 long minutes. I'm sorry, do you have any questions? Yes, Zane? Any uh, one else before I just ramble on and on and on about useless things? <sighs> Wesley. I'm wondering if power is different than privilege. No, they're the same. I've got a question. That's it? You're so easily satisfied. Why it's so unstudent like. Can you Imagine you go to College Avenue in Berkeley today and um, you know what Cold's Coffee is? You know where Safeway is? There you go. Where Phil's coffee shop is, it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. So, uh, there is this sign outside of Ike's sandwich shop. And it's about 11, by the time you get there, it'll probably be 11 to 30, 12. And you have 20 bucks in your pocket you just found, or someone gave it to you, you saved it. And you say, yeah. Turkey sandwich with everything on it. Then you have more $20 bills at the house, so you are about to walk in. And as you walk in, there is a woman who's sitting on the ground. You look at her clothes, it's all torn. You look at her legs. You look at her hair, just the way she is, and you kind of feel bad. But you also want your sandwich. But the presence of this woman robs you of that privilege, of the desire, of comfort. And you realize that you had the privilege to go buy a sandwich. The sight of this woman robs her power from you, and privilege is replaced with guilt. And let's just say you're callous enough not to even feel guilty. You go in, you get your sandwich, and you're very hungry. So right in front of her, you take a big bite of the sandwich, and she looks at you. And now you feel guilty, and then you feel ashamed. Add to the fact that you're an 18-year-old punk, and she is 70. And you realize you have zero respect for this woman who is like five times your age. She has the privilege of being homeless. And without her knowing, she has the power to make you feel bad about your position in life. And all of a sudden you realize, yes, you had privilege. But also this homeless person had the privilege of making you feel bad. It doesn't mean you're going to give her your sandwich. It just means that you can no longer enjoy it the way you wanted to. Privilege means having the ability to have resources and then using your, those resources. And people have, again, you know, they have uh, physical, emotional, intellectual, spiritual. Privilege basically means having something. She has the emotional privilege. No, she doesn't really, I mean, maybe it's a projection. Maybe it's a projection where you look at someone and just feel bad about where they are in life and there isn't much you can do. Any uh, one else before we 
I know. Uh, you said there was an example of Quran that had 116 chapters. Do you know which museum it was? I don't really know. Did you owned by? Owned by. Owned by. I don't really know. So do you think there would be a reason for that museum to display propaganda? I think what happens is, first, the way Quran came about was not in the time of the Prophet. It was many years later. And it wasn't like people knew how to read or write. People memorized. And human memory, you can't trust it too well. I'm not saying it's completely fallible, but there are shades of it that you can't completely trust. So what you have is time passes, and you have someone like Omar who says, okay, those who have memorized, who have sat, it's called people are ahl safi people of the rock, who walk around with the prophet or Jesus or Moses, whomever, it doesn't really matter. I mean, do it this way instead of reacting to something I said. You see what's happening right now. I have spoken in this class for about an hour and 10 minutes. You could have asked many number of different questions, but that's not what you did. You went back to your history, you went back to your tradition, you went back to your belief system, and you reacted. Add to it, you gave yourself away by calling something propaganda. This is, I'm not trying to blame or make a judgment about your position, you know, either way. All I'm saying is that life is huge, history is grand, it has a lot of unknowns. The truth is, you're young. You have all these ideas about marriage. You have all these beautiful ideas about being a parent and having children. But once you get into the game, everything changes, man. Everything changes. You know, a lot of my people, men, I'm sure it's true for your culture as well, a lot of men go back home to find a suitable companion for marriage. They live here, they're like two-thirds American, one-third Persian, or one-third Yemeni. And they bring someone from there to here. Now, the woman is not American in any way, or they're all Yemenis or Persian. The culture is just in them. When they get married, the men behave two-thirds American, one-third Persian. And the woman sits back and says, what the heck is this? And then she suffers. And then the man comes home expecting ridiculous things. All I'm saying is before marriage, you say, I'm going to be such a great father, or such a great husband, or such a great this, such a great that. And then your hands get dirty and you realize how ill-equipped you are. That's all I'm saying. This is not to be offensive to anyone's tradition especially religious tradition. You know, the New Testament, the Christmas story, you have to bring together all four Gospels to make the Christmas story happen. No single Gospel will do. And the funny thing about the Gospels is this. The Gospel of Mark, about 60 years after the death of Jesus, 40 to 60 years. I mean, consider for a moment. Someone who had never seen Jesus wrote the book. And now people are running around believing it. That's insane. It doesn't even say I'm God. It just says I'm a teacher. The only gospel you will find that Jesus says I'm God is the gospel of John. That's it. Now, if you happen to be a devout Christian, that comment is offensive. But you shouldn't take off the fence. Just go read the goddamn book. It's there. You can believe whatever, man. The kids believe in Santa Claus. There's nothing wrong with them. I entertain them. And the truth is, if you have a belief system that makes you into a decent human being, believe in it. There is nothing wrong with it. This is education. It means I'm going to be telling you things that sometimes you may not be feeling very comfortable with. That's just the way it is.
If you're really curious, this is the age of the internet, man. Go do research on your own. But you have to care for your position. Where is the museum? And you speak about propaganda, but I doubt very much you know the history of propaganda. You have a shop, yes? You have a shop? Do you advertise? What, you don't have anything on the windows? Propaganda. You create desires. You create wants. You create needs. You can't function in life without advertisement. And advertisement is propaganda. You have to do it to survive. Do you date? Have you ever spoken to someone where you wanted to like show yourself? Well, what do you do? Do you say, I smoke? Well, that's a bad piece of advertisement, unless you hang out with Snoop Dogg. You always offer to your people the best image of yourself. Propaganda. You have no choice. It's just what we do, what we have done for thousands of years. <coughs> Hey, buddy, you see what I got to go through? <laughs> Abi, there is this book by uh, Jean Anouy. He's a French playwright. He borrowed it from Sophocles. Um, here are lots of tragedies, the most famous Antigone. In Jean Anouy's version of Antigone, Antigone is this 12-year-old girl, and man, she feels, and she thinks, and she reflects, and she understands, and she pays attention. And one day she goes to her father and says, Dad, I just want to die. I don't want to become an adult. And I see the adults, they're corrupt, they're contaminated. They create everything but a civilized world. I just don't want to grow up. گلی که خون به دادم پیچ و تابش ز آب دیدگونم دادم آبش به درگاه الهی کی روابی گل از ما دیگری گیر گلابش You enter into something with a good amount of sincerity and passion and it just becomes a dead ritual after a while Anyone else? We have two minutes Sibley? <laughs> <laughs> In two minutes. Yes. Uh, I think the thing that I'm, I'm curious about is the context in which, like, what is the, the textual paradigm in which your thoughts evolved over time that you came to hear? If you remember to ask the question on Monday, maybe we can wrestle with it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, forgive me for, yeah. I wanted to tell you because you told us to tell you that I disagree with some of the things you said. Okay. It makes me feel angry, but I'm too sleepy to tell you about it, and I can't put the words together. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> Lewis? Oh, yeah. There's uh, people that see how bad it gets from the end, they want to die, but there's also people that really like what they've been living through, so they want to longer. Are there been people that have, out of fear, out of what? Have people made their life missions to try to prolong their life, their lifespan, lifetime, maybe with technology? The, the idea of death um, has been around for a long, long time. I mean, first, it's a reality, second, it's our relationship. Let me just give it to you in this way and then we'll go home. My wife and I uh, were driving a couple weeks ago and at a certain point I look at her and say, Sarah, listen. And you know, when you've been teaching the way I do and have had my experiences, I, my, one of my best companion, companions is death. She's so thinking about it all the time and writing about it. And say, listen, we need to get some things in order, just in case anything happens to me, A, B, C, D. 
And I look at her and she's like crying. And the point I'm trying to make is the idea that at a certain point your life will end. And when you're young, you don't really think about those things very often, unless there's just something wrong with you, you know. Uh, like you've been around the idea too much. And if you happen to be like a Palestinian or Israeli or some forsaken place where bombs are dropping on your head on a daily basis, you're surrounded by death all the time. And eventually, one of the nice things about human beings is that we get used to almost everything under the sun. Just be exposed to something over and over and over again, it'll become normal, okay? If it doesn't become normalized for you, what you realize is that the idea of death means the idea of no longer being around, no longer being relevant, no longer being remembered. And at a certain point, you evaluate your life, okay? You look at your house and you say, I spent all of my life buying sofas and chairs and this and that. All I really want to do is now put them in front for people to take. Does it mean that I wasted most of my life? And the answer is yes. When we come to a place where we can talk about death in a more in-depth way, we'll talk about good death, bad death, tragic death, death ceremonies, death rituals from Neanderthals, up to the present. Add to it that the death industry right now is about $150 billion rich. People pray for you to die so they can sell you a casket, air-conditioned Bluetooth. Indestructible. One of the nice things about America you need to understand is everything ultimately has a price tag to it. It's monetary, everything is. It's good to see all of you. Have a nice weekend. Don't drink, don't smoke. <laughs>